I mean, they, these are things that like, uh, you know, maybe on Star Trek, I thought was possible, but <laughs> certainly, you know, um, I did not think, I thought this would be more fiction than science. Welcome to another AMA, where we're asking Dr. Hunter Truick, Vice President of Clinical Services and Technologies at Orbis International, your questions about the world's first and only flying eye hospital. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So I think uh, we need to make sure we're all on the same page. The biggest question is probably going to be, what is a flying eye hospital? Flying eye hospital is a brainchild of a Texas uh, ophthalmologist named David Payton in the late 70s. Uh, where he wanted to connect the world through sight and be able to move U.S. training, U.S. hospitals, and the latest and greatest technologies and techniques around the world for free. And so this was a bold vision back in the 70s, and it first took flight in 1982. We're on our third plane, an MD-10, which is a U.S. accredited hospital that goes around and does not only surgical care, but surgical teaching. And for yourself, what sparked your interest in ophthalmology and in Orbis? I knew going into medical school, I wanted to do a surgical field, and I was already doing global work since I was 19. I thought I was going to do orthopedics because it's just really cool, like hand surgery and all that was really cool. But then I saw eye surgery where you didn't need an ICU, you didn't need fancy equipment. And literally in one day, you could transform a life and a family. And when I saw the power of ophthalmology and also the kind of application to low to middle income countries, it was a no brainer for me. Wow, that's really beautiful. I feel like you've gotten a, a bunch more people into ophth ophthalmology with that story. Well, let me just talk to your audience. It's the first field in all of medicine to have FDA approval for gene therapy and also the first to have FDA approval for autonomous AI for diagnostics. And we're now doing that at Orbis. We have our own in-house AI called CyberSight, and we've done clinical trials in Rwanda and around the world that has the same diagnostic accuracy as a human and is freely available to the world. So it is unbelievable how the portfolio at Orbis has expanded from 1982's first flight to now running AI and virtual reality simulators. Super exciting. Come to ophthalmology. <laughs> Definitely. So you're using artificial intelligence on the plane. Tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah. So the plane is really a platform. And while certainly our primary mission is to give the best patient care possible and also the best training, we're also to, able to convert the plane into a simulation center. So we can use an Oculus headset and uh, train people in small incision cataract surgery. We can teach people from everything from school teachers on how to find eye diseases in the classroom to the chairs of a department on how to use autonomous AI to diagnose diseases of the back of the eye, like diabetic retinopathy, macular degeneration, and glaucoma. So the plane really has the entire spectrum of technology. I tell everyone we can do the same surgery that you do in Toronto. We can also teach how to do cataract surgery with the absolute bare minimum equipment. Wow, that's really amazing how much technology has really, you know, helped advance this work. It's really cool to see, you know, just the range as well of the people that this AI can help. Orbis has always been at the forefront of technology. So whether it's in aviation or simulation or artificial intelligence, all of those are force multipliers that we want to put in the hands of our partners in the places that need it most. And so, yeah, you mentioned um, innovations. This plane is like, it didn't start off as a flying eye hospital, I'm sure. I believe it's from a FedEx plane, basically, that gets transformed. Yeah, so the current plane we're flying is the third generation. So we started off on a DC-8 and then a DC-10, and now we're on an MD-10 plane. And FedEx has been with us from the very beginning. They're an incredible partner. They not only provide us with the plane, but the parts, the technicians, the pilots, all of the people who fly our plane are volunteers from FedEx. So without FedEx, our mission does not exist. And what we were able to do over several years was convert a cargo plane into a hospital. Now, that's, that is requiring air filtration, water filtration, electrical backup, water purifiers. So you can imagine the amount of engineering that goes inside that hospital. And so one of the things I love is that no matter where we are in the world, we're able to give the highest level of care possible. When we land, the only thing we ask of our partners are patients who need our help, nurses and doctors and anesthesiologists that want to work with us, 
and stairs. That's it. We're a completely self-sufficient hospital. We carry all of our own supplies, all of our own equipment. So really, uh, when we land, we can convert in about eight hours from flight mode to hospital mode, and we're ready to teach and take care of patients. I'll let you guess where we are now. We're in the cockpit. And one of the things I love about Orbis is how we've combined the concepts in aviation and ophthalmology. We have over 450 volunteers from over 26 countries that come on board, not to show off, but to show how. So much of what we do is about technology and training, increasing doctors' abilities by transferring skills during our flying eye hospital programs. Not only do we work with doctors, we work with nurses, engineers, and anesthesiologists. Anesthesiologists are critical for pediatrics. We did a lot of children this week with strabismus or ocular misalignment, and the anesthesiologists are critical to giving them safe and secure care. Wow, that's that's amazing and incredible how many different fields of STEM is involved in this project, creating such a positive impact around the world. So, you know, you go all over the world. What does a typical project look like from start to finish? Yeah, so I think there is no typical. I think we always try to have a standardized but customized approach. In some places, they really want us to focus on pediatrics, and they ask us to come in the summer when there's no school. So I think the first thing we need to do when we start a project is listen to our partners. What are their training needs? What are their requirements? It usually starts uh, about a month before the plane lands, getting all the patients organized, but it starts a year in advance, getting all the permits, the volunteers, the supplies and all that. We try to not only meet the training request of our partners, but also address the leading causes of blindness in those countries. Now, remember the vast majority, up to 80% of all blindness in the world can be prevented or cured. And 90% of that is in low to middle income countries. So our plane is really focused on those countries. We've been to over 95 countries with the Flying Eye Hospital since it first took flight in 1982. I'm super proud of that. Yeah, that's uh, very impressive. And uh, I can't imagine sort of how many people's lives have been improved because of that. And the real thing is the feed forward cycle of education where, well, certainly we treat patients What's more exciting is when I go back and work with some of the doctors that I first met 20 years ago, and now they're the head of the department. They're the number one surgeon in the country, and I still remember teaching them their first stitch or their first suture. I think when you'd go back to planning an Orbis project, the typical first day of the week is where we see clinical patients. And we, these are patients that are selected from the doctors we're working with in training. These are diagnostic or treatment challenges for them. We discuss them two to four weeks beforehand on CyberSight with telemedicine so that when the plane lands, all of those patients are on our electronic medical record. We know everything we need to do. The doctor is seeing the patient and meeting the hands-on surgeons for the first time on that first clinic day. And then we have surgeries for the next four days where the doctor will be both on the plane, but then also rotating uh, at the local hospital. So we're teaching using their supplies, their technologies, and there's usually about three subspecialties. So we have two subspecialties on the plane and one at the local hospital. When the doctor at the local hospital uh, is operating, they're just literally working from 7 a.m. till 7 p.m. But on the plane, one doctor is giving lectures in the morning, the other's operating, and then they switch. So you'll see that our mission is all about training and teaching. So it really takes a village to give their child back. And we want to train and work with every piece of that pathway. Welcome to the audio, visual, and IT room. On board, we have our own server. And you'll see that we have cameras throughout the plane so that we can broadcast, record, and produce teaching materials from every program where we are. This plane is really an engineering masterpiece. Not only are we able to give the highest technology and the best training and the best classrooms, but we're also able to give the highest level of care. Everything on this plane was designed to teach or to take care of someone who needs their vision restored. Follow me in the laser room. 
So this is a very important uh, part of the plane. It's kind of the heart of the plane, where not only do we train with the simulators and take care of our post-ops, but it's also where we take care of the families while they wait for their family members to get out of the operating room, which is right behind those windows. So now we're leaving the laser room and the simulation room. We're walking down the hallway to get to the recovery room. As we're walking down the hallway, you'll see that our engineers are working on the microscopes, our anesthesiologist is working with the nurses, getting everything ready for tomorrow. This OR is probably the most unique aspect of our plane in that it is a U.S. certified OR. We can go anywhere in the world and give the same surgery as you get in Vancouver. We have our own oxygen concentrators, we have our own water filtration, air filtration, electrical backup. Everything here is designed to give the highest level of care, but in this OR, we're also, just like the front of the plane, constantly teaching. We have six cameras in the OR, including one in the microscope, that broadcast to the classroom, as well as to CyberSite. So it's always impressive when you look in this window and you'll see people from all over the world. That right now we have our anesthesiologist from Chile talking to our nurse from China. We have our biomedical engineer from Myanmar. At any given time, you may have four or five countries all working together to give this one patient the best care possible and exchange skills with their local counterparts, with nursing, doctors, and anesthesia. What have you learned from working with local doctors around the world? First of all, I've learned certainly some of the best surgeons in the world are not from North America. So I work with some of the best from Canada, from the US, uh, but I can assure you some of the most talented surgeons I work with are outside of North America. I've learned how to innovate because obviously we are very highly resourced and sometimes you don't have to be creative when you have an abundance of surplus of supplies or things like that. For example, in Nepal, I've seen cataract surgery being done without um, electricity. So uh, yeah, I always tell uh, people that the, the Flying Eye Hospital is really a skills exchange program. And I will see diseases and pathology that I don't see in North America. I wasn't trained on that during my residency. So diseases like trachoma, which is an infectious cause of blindness. Uh, it's one of my life's goals to see that get off the planet by the time I die. Uh, every year, Orbis distributes over $200 million of the antibiotic Zithromax to get rid of that. Well, I never saw that during my residency. My first month in Ethiopia, I saw hundreds of cases. So I would say that um, certainly I've learned a ton surgically. I've learned a lot from diseases and pathology. But I really appreciate the cultural nuances in patient uh, communication, how to problem solve, creative solutions. So for me, I've constantly been learning at Orbis. Uh, I've, I'm both the, the, a student and, and a doctor. It is the way with life in general, too, right? We're all learning, even as experts. So I think that's really important to keep in mind. Absolutely. It seems like you're emphasizing as well the importance of lived experiences of people who, you know, from all over the world and what they kind of offer. Yeah, and I, I get to work with some of the top talent. You'll be happy to know that Canada is actually the number one country for volunteers per capita. And our three most volunteered ophthalmologists are all Canadian. So we had one Canadian, unfortunately he passed away, but he was my hero. He did over 110 programs at Orbis. So you'll see that um, a lot of the nursing team has Canadian roots. So I, I'm really proud to say that our Flying Eye Hospital is really the best example of functional diplomacy, where we literally have over a dozen countries represented. We will sometimes have four or five continents in the operating room working together, bringing their way of skinning the cat or their way of doing something to uh, the procedure. But for me, I think you should take great pride in knowing that Canada has always been a crown jewel, not just of our staff, but also our volunteer base. That's so great to hear. I think as, as Canadians, we often don't realize how much we're doing globally. So that's really uplifting to hear. And it also sounds like this project is much more international than the International Space Station, like to see how many people and countries are involved with this. It's incredible, even though we're all very different individuals, when we're in that operating room, there's only two things that matter, teaching as much as possible and helping the patient under the drape. Every time I look through the window and watch that team operate with just seamless efficiency and compassion, 
I realize that the world is filled with good things. It just doesn't make it to TV these days. Well, we need to bring more attention to this then. Well, it, hopefully it that's really what you're is. doing. Yeah. <laughs> that is the goal. That is the goal. Um, and then is there anything else you could tell us about the role that Canada plays in Orbis's work as well? Absolutely. So we actually have an Orbis Canada office in Toronto. So we actively fundraise. We do research. In fact, we've brought artificial intelligence to remote communities in Canada. So um, Canada is a very important strategic partner for volunteers, for innovation, and also fundraising. So uh, one of the things that our CEO of Orbis Canada, her name is Lisa McKean, she is exquisitely focused in gender and healthcare, how we can champion and have more mentorship for female health providers, but also how we can help close the gap. There's a disproportionate number of women and girls who are affected by avoidable or treatable blindness. And that's something that Lisa, Lisa has championed from day one of joining Orbis Canada. So I really love what Orbis Canada brings to the equation. I learned through Orbis that there are 112 more Sorry, 112 million more women yeah. globally yeah, million. than men. <laughs> million. It was, yes, if it was only 112, I'd be done by the end of the day. <laughs> you're, you're, you're done, right? You're set, you can retire. Yes. Um, globally, yes, there are 112 million more women than men living with vision loss. What are some reasons behind this inequity? So a lot of times it's access. Uh, for example, young boys are given priority over young girls. Sometimes it's awareness or education, literacy rates, things such as this. And that's one of the things, it's not just simply that women live longer, that they have disproportionate blindness. It's often an equity or a uh, access issue. And that's why we do campaigns, for example, in Zambia about community eye health and community mobilization. Uh, in India, one of the things I was super excited, and we did some amazing research uh, that got into Lancet Global Health, where 90% of the tea pickers are women. And what we were able to show by correcting their vision, they could improve their take-home pay by 20% if they were over 40 and over 30% if they were over 50, just by correcting near vision and some of those things. So I think Orbis leads the way in the gender space with research, mentorship, advocacy, and public awareness. I think all those, it's a very complex problem, certainly more than the 20 seconds I'm allowed here to answer it. But one of the things I would say is Lisa McKean, who's our CEO of Orbis Canada, has revolutionized our approach to gender in the eye care space. And it's incredible. It's a privilege to work with her. That sounds like fantastic work. And um, I think we sometimes take our vision for granted. So at Orbis, uh, we always do vision research that gets in peer reviewed literature. Like, you know, I, I think you can tell by the way I talk, I'm not God's gift to research. I don't know the difference between mean, median and mode, but I'm super, super, I, I demand that our research go outside the eye space to show how vision affects five E's, education, economics, equity, emotional health, and environmental health. So we did a lot of research about how uh, refractive error and vision loss in young children can affect their educational trajectory as well as their emotional health. I already mentioned the thing about economics. One of the things I love about our AI is the diversity of the training sets. So we have an incredibly diverse and rich global training set from populations around the world. So there's not a bias towards one specific country or one specific uh, uh, set of uh, people or populations. And then the last one is the environmental uh, piece. Obviously, I think our generation has seen firsthand how important the environment is, uh, especially for health. I think that is climate change is going to be a very real phenomena. One of the things I love is how we now in the, the very remote villages of India, for example, we have green vision centers, which are completely solar uh, dependent off the grid. And what those vision centers are able to do is not only access patients, but give the, the women who own them female entrepreneurship. So again, that goes back to that gender piece where you're solving multiple plot problems, but they're all intersecting with environmental health, the vision piece, and then women's empowerment through entrepreneurship and job uh, employment or uh, job creation. I thought we were done with all the uh, overlapping STEM fields and now we, you've just brought in more. <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine how cool it must be to be in med school these days where, you know, you're literally doing gene therapy. You're literally doing artificial intelligence and how we're going to bring that technology in. I mean, what you're going to see and what, you know, the doctors are going to have at their fingertips in 10 years 
I, I can't even imagine what that's going to look like, right? Uh, so my job is, you know, to make sure that all those technologies and all those treatments get to the bottom billion or the people who need it most in low to middle income countries. And so that's what Orbis does is connect people, whether it's through mentorship or telemedicine for patient care. I think the theme of this uh, AMA is really just hope. And, and what's really crazy is, uh, and I mean crazy in the best way possible, um, I was mentoring a 15-year-old young man uh, from southern India who came to the U.S. He is now a sophomore at Stanford. He sold two companies, and he built an app when he was 16, and we had to wait till his 18th birthday so he could officially donate it to Orbis that now is turning iPhones and cell phones into vision charts. And he has now reached hundreds of thousands of patients around the world just by an app he did as a high school kid in Texas. So, you know, for me, what's exciting is how one person, one innovation, one technology can literally have huge impact around the world. And you don't have to even leave your chair or your bedroom, right? Right now we're in the Alcon classroom and this looks like any other commercial flight deck. Uh, you'll see that here we have our TV which connects to the operating room, but also for all of our lectures. And the Orbis plane is all about making connections, connecting the best trainers with the best partners around the world. And now with the internet and our program called CyberSight, we're able to broadcast our classroom around the world. So for today, we had 46 participants in this classroom from Peru, but we had 33 countries watching the same surgery and the same lectures from all over the world for free using our CyberSight webinar platform. It's fantastic to know that the impact of what happens in the trainings and the discussions that happen here can happen now anywhere in the world at a moment's notice because of the power of the internet and CyberSight. Last week, we had a lecture from Germany. He gave a live lecture. How many countries, not people, how many countries do you think were watching and interacting live? Just throw out a crazy number. Um, 35. 105. Whoa. We had half of the world watching live and discussing as a community. I mean, they, these are things that like, uh, you know, maybe on Star Trek, I thought was possible. <laughs> but certainly, you know, um, I did not think, I thought this would be more fiction than science. But I would say the sci-fi that I thought about as a med student and, you know, when, when we were just discussing gene therapy and just discussing some of this stuff, now it's, it's incredible. I mean, your iPhone is one of the most powerful tools ever created in humankind. I think we get a little uh, pessimistic and skeptical about all of our technology and how um, codependent we are on it. <laughs> but like, clearly you've outlined all these amazing things that technology has also been, allowed us to do. Yeah, I mean, I think technology just amplifies what's already there. Everyone's heard about machine learning. We've actually trademarked the term machine mentoring where we've turned AI into a teacher. And so as it goes through and looks at the back of the eye, the retina, it actually highlights all the pathology and shows how the diagnosis and the differential diagnosis was made. You can't exhaust that mentor and it's available at your fingertips to anyone in the world. And certainly, you know, I'll be in Mongolia for the almost the entire month of August. And this has been a long-term partner where we're bringing AI to help diagnose uh, premature infants and make sure they don't go blind from retinopathy of prematurity. We're going into the rural countryside and using the self-refracting glasses. So where there is no optometrist or eye health provider, people are now able to do their own glass prescriptions. I mean, it's just super cool. And none of that, if you had told me that when I first went to Mongolia over a dozen years ago, I would have told you to put down the, the punch. You've had enough to drink, right? <laughs> So come on through these doors. We're now going to go to the recovery room, which is where the patients after their surgeries are monitored and given the instructions for their follow-up care. This is the scrub basin where the doctors will wash their hands, the nurses will wash their hands so that they'll do the sterile technique. We also teach instrument care. We have an entire part of our nursing team that goes through how to sterilize instruments and take care of these very, very delicate eye surgical tools. Um, we're also in this area teach a lot of anesthesia where our, our team works with the local anesthesiologist to go over how to, you know, 
create a child-friendly environment, how to give safe pediatric anesthesia. And our nurses sometimes will set up training sessions and simulation sessions here in their recovery room after the patients have gone to cover critical things like CPR, instrument sterilization, or working with anesthesiologists when there's a medical emergency. You've shared so many stories already. Do you have like a favorite memory of, of your work with Orbis? Yeah, I mean, I would say that's the one thing I love about my job is every month I see something amazing, whether it's sunrise at the Taj Mahal or flying over the polar ice caps. Uh, seeing a mom reconnect with their child that she's never been able to see before because of cataracts or something like that, or a grandparent see their grandchild for the first time. Uh, I always love how we use CyberSight for telemedicine. We set the record for the youngest cataract patient in the country of Mongolia, where I'll be next month. How old do you think that patient was? Youngest cataract. So less than two uh, months. And yeah, so some children are born with it. And what's really interesting is because we knew it was genetic, the parents had it as well. As soon as the next child was born, we screened before there was any vision loss or any uh, opa severe opacity in the lens because we knew they were going to get it. But what's really great is the local doctors who we've helped train, we've given them fellowships and equipment. They're now doing the surgeries even when the plane is not there. So for me, you know, being able to think about genetics and teaching, you know, genetic counselors, I mean, these are big topics, right? But if you say, Hunter, what's the really cool thing about Orbis is the legacy, the patient care legacy, but also the academic legacy, where, as I said earlier, some of the residents that I trained 20 years ago are now the chairmen's and chair, you know, heads of the department, which totally makes me excited where you can see that virtuous cycle of growth and education from one person teaching and getting a fellowship to now the whole department benefiting from that, that one champion or that one thought leader. Wow, that's really, really cool. It's kind of like, the sky really is the limit here. <laughs> well, ironically, when you're flying in a plane, yes, yes, we're not able to go, we're not able to go into the, uh, the cosmos, yes, not yeah. yet. Well, it's funny, I actually was in Canada, one of our board members, uh, she herself is a wildly impressive physician. Her husband is an astronaut and as part of the Canadian uh, aerospace team and has been on the space station. And one of the top three health concerns of astronauts are the back of their eye. There's a retinopathy or a problem in the retina. And so, you know, I, I get to sit and talk to an astronaut about eye problems or I sit. I mean, I constantly learn just like I'm learning from you and thinking about things as you ask questions. I learn by conversations. And one of the coolest things about Orbis is every dinner table has someone amazing, whether it's a patient, a family, a local doctor or one of our volunteers. That's something that I love to live by, too, when I meet people is that everyone is interesting and can learn something from... Oh, especially the, the patients. And uh, I, I've had some amazing... Like some of these kids I've now seen and they've become young adults and they still remember walking on an airplane for the first time or they remember that, you know, we give them a, a teddy bear called Seymour. Obviously, we try to help children see more. And that teddy bear is given to every patient, not just as a uh, comfort aid, but actually it's an educational tool where before they go to sleep, we have them put the patch on the same eye that they're going to have surgery on so they know what to expect, why there's a patch. And then we have them take the patch off Seymour before we take it off of them. So, you know, one of the things I would say is I remember kids now that are now young adults saying, I remember you gave me that bear. I remember. And I'm like, that was seven years ago. They're, they're like, you never, you never forget stepping on the Orvis plane. So that's exciting. Wow. Right? That really is. That must make you feel super proud of what you do and well, all the people you work with. I think the dumbest question you can ask someone is, are you happy? Um, because <laughs> if, if you are happy, you have to come out of that flow state to think about it, the question, and then you stop being happy. <laughs> and if you're not happy, you're depressed for not being happy. The right question <laughs> to ask someone is three parts. Mm -hmm. Are you surrounded good by good people? Mm -hmm. Are you learning and growing? And are you doing something that you find meaningful? And for mm -hmm. me, those three things are yes at Orbis. Now, my buddy back home teaches softball with his daughter's softball team. He loves being a coach. He has assembled like almost an Olympic squad around him and he loves teaching young girls about sports. So he has the same passion talking about, you know, uh, middle school softball team as I do Orvis. 
it doesn't matter what your thing is, if it's blindness or softball or whatever. I think what's really important in life is finding what really gives you personal meaning, surrounding yourself with some really stellar people and learning. I think when you stop learning and growing, you get, no matter how much money you're making, you start getting very depressed or you can get distracted by some unpleasant things in life in the long run. Do you have anything else to add or, you know, any uh, misconceptions people might have about eye health? Well, I think a lot of times people don't know, like you said, you take your vision for granted that people forget that they're, you know, 30% of our patients are children. People don't realize that children can have cataracts or children can have glaucoma. So pediatric awareness and screening is super important. So we do a lot with pediatric vision. I think, you know, one of the things I hope your listeners hear is that a, the vast majority of blindness could be prevented or cured. 90% of that is in low to middle income countries and it disproportionately affects women, not just 112, but 112 million. <laughs> 12 million. Yes. <laughs> so yes, absolutely. I would say that um, if people can remember that, what I would say is as you do your career, look for ways to have global impact. Look at ways to help those that are less fortunate, whether it's through service uh, delivery, through skill transfer and teaching, through fellowships or telemedicine. I promise you doing global work will remind you why you went into medicine.